Dr. Jason Clay is the SVP of Markets for the World Wildlife Fund. Dr. Clay, uh, welcome to the show. But And as we get into this, it seems that sustainability is something that you've been working on your entire career. Yeah, I, I would say it actually started before my career <laughs> in the sense that um, I grew up on a small farm. And I, um, when I was, I mean, it was small. It was for 15 years, we lived on less than a dollar a day. So for me, these kind of issues are about sustainability, about poverty alleviation, about food production, food security, et cetera, are real. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not academic. Uh, when I was 15, my father was killed in an accident on the farm, and my mother and I had to figure out how to run the farm. Uh, and so from that point on, it was very clear with a small farm and seven children that there was no future in farming. But what was the future, and how could farming be a, a kind of slingshot into something better? Food security is something that is, is being talked about a lot here at the CGI 2012. Um, but I think from the global standpoint, food and just having enough of it for, for our population is something that's been talked about for a long time. Right. Uh, and I think you'll get differences of opinion. There are a lot of people who think that if you add the numbers up, how much food is produced, how many people there are, you divide it out, there should be enough to go around. Um, and that kind of misses the point a little bit. Half of farmers on the planet today can't feed themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of an interesting thing. And for a lot of the urban poor, I mean the really poor that are food insecure, they can spend up to 70% of their, their income on food and still go hungry. Mm -hmm. So yes, there may be enough food available, but can, is it affordable? I mean, is it distributed? Do we have the right trading systems, et cetera? Food and, you know, is, is still one of the most tariff prone and barrier prone kinds of industries we have on the planet. There are higher tariffs on food than, than any other sector. Is there a, a protectionism that exists around the world that is that is that way because frankly food is so valuable? I, th I think there's a there's a fear. I think the protectionism comes from fear not of food being valuable but becoming dependent on other people for it. And so often what these trade barriers do is actually jack the price of food up, which makes it even less affordable to local people. Uh, now clearly you don't want farmers undermined by you know, other cheaper produce coming in from around the world. But I think those kind of issues could be, could be addressed. By the same token, comparative advantage is real. On a finite planet with only so many resources, we should be producing the food where we can produce it best. And we should be using trade to help move it around to get it to the right people. Uh, keeping small farmers, I mean, this is something I think we really have to come to terms with. But for me, Programs aimed at making, at, at keeping small farmers small farmers are about maintaining poverty. They're not about alleviating it. Mm -hmm. And I think as, as a planet, we've got to really question whether that's a good strategy or not. Are you saying that we need to let the small farmers go and just create big farms? I'm saying that small farmers are going. Uh, <laughs> whether we like it or not. The, the, on yeah. every continent in every country, the number of people living in rural areas is declining. It's not increasing. Mm -hmm. So it's already happening. And if you take into account that farm families tend to be as large or larger on average, that means there's a lot of kids that are actually leaving, even if the farmers' numbers are staying the mm -hmm. same. So that they're going down, it means a lot of exodus there. So it's already happening. Are we preparing them for the 21st century? Do they have education? Do they have the skill set? Do do we have the food processing and the, the systems in place that allow a small farmer's child, boy or girl, to have a foot in farming and a foot outside so that they can begin a transition into something different? Well, is there a way to make uh, farming in the rural area lucrative enough to be able to uh, attract people again? Sure. I, I think for a certain number of people, and it isn't always the size of the farm that it, you know, makes it viable or not. It's what you're growing, how much it's worth. There, there are lots of ways to look at that, but you've also got to realize that that a lot of small farmers are occupying pieces of land that aren't very valuable to other people. Therefore, they're kind of marginal from an economic point of view, and therefore, it's hard for them to produce, and it's hard for them to make money in a market economy. And so they're kind of, they've got two strikes against them already. Mm -hmm. uh, and to expect that kind of thing to really work, I think we just, we, we need to be thoughtful. Let me put it another way. 
if you could increase the productivity of a small farmer 1% a year for the next 20 years, if you could increase the price paid to them by 1% a year for the next 20 years, you still wouldn't solve this problem. Really? Because it's a bigger problem well, than that. Well, let's say you've got two kids, mm -hmm. and they cut the amount of land in half because each one's going to f small half of farm half of that small farm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're not going to be able to make it. They're, they're in negative numbers already. Now, a lot of people talk about Africa in, in, in terms of Africa being the future of agriculture. Is that realistic? I don't know if Africa is the future of agriculture, but, but I would say Africa is becoming a future center of a lot more food consumption. So Africa is going to have, by most accounts, the largest population growth in absolute terms of any region, not in necessarily in numbers. Asia is still going to be ahead. But Africa is also going to have increases in income and therefore increases in consumption per capita mm -hmm. uh, that are going to be bigger than anybody else because they're starting at a lower, lower level. So Africa is going to be a place where there's going to be more and more demand for food. Whether it's produced in Africa, I don't know. I mean, if you look at the record, my understanding is that Africa has lost about 1% of soil fertility per year since the end of colonialism. Hmm. What's that from? Uh, I think it's from poor management practices. It's not maintaining, uh, it's not increasing the knowledge about how to manage. It's not making inputs available. Uh, it's, it's people kind of reverting to a kind of agriculture that, that mines the soil as much as it, it actually protects it, hmm. mines it for nutrients. And, and that, that's not unique to Africa. That happens in a lot of other places too. And, and, and while we, we've been talking about agriculture, we probably should talk about aquaculture as well and fishing. Mm -hmm. And it seems that there are reports of fish stocks around the world becoming depleted as well. Right. So depending on who you, you talk to, you know, half of global fish stocks are already fished at or beyond uh, their limits. And by... Um, 2040, 2050, you're going to have that number rise up quite a bit. There have been some, some I think, turnarounds on fisheries, some, some that were poorly managed that have come back, but others not so much, like the cod industry. It hasn't really bounced back the way we thought it would. But here's, here's my question. If we're going to have, by 2050, 9.4 billion people, which is a kind of accepted number, and they're going to consume twice as much, even if we could stabilize fisheries populations, we're not going to increase productivity on them. So where's the fish going to come from? We don't hunt and gather deer anymore. We don't hunt and gather nuts and berries on a commercial scale. Mm -hmm. So hunting and gathering fish going forward is going to be less significant, I think, as part of a seafood stream than aquaculture. Already, as of about two or three years ago, aquaculture production at least in terms of human consumed seafood, surpassed wild caught fish. So it's already bigger. Hmm. And aquaculture production has been around a relatively short time, not in China, uh, but, but in the rest of the world, it's, it's taken off pretty rapidly. So what's the solution? Well, getting aqu aquaculture right. So getting it so that the impacts are acceptable, so that we're not using more fish to grow a fish than the fish is yielding. So we don't want to use too many fish in, in feed. You know, we would like to look at lower trophic level species because that, from an aquaculture point of view, would mean that we're using less fish meal, less fish oil, et cetera. Um, we'd like to use uh, species that actually grow well and, and grow quickly. So, you know, rather than talking about tons of fish, let's talk about, you know, how many calories of fish can we produce from aquaculture in a in a certain footprint area or in a certain footprint of water or in a certain amount of feed, et cetera. And that's not just aquaculture. I think we need to start doing that with agriculture too. We live on a finite planet with finite resources. Uh, we talk about total tons of production. We might talk about tons of production or bushels in the U.S. of production per acre, but we don't eat bushels and we don't eat tons. So. So how many calories is that per acre? Because that's what we eat. Or how many nutrients is that? Mm -hmm. And we're not managing the planet from a calorie point of view or a nutrient point of view. There are also, though, many, many reports that there's so much food waste. In the Western world, there's, there's food waste that is 
post table in the uh, developing uh, world, which we here at Rainmakers call impact countries, um, their food waste comes from poor preservation, it seems. Uh, is, is that pretty accurate? Is there a way to reverse the poor preservation techniques in an in a economically sustainable way? Right. So, so globally, about one out of every three calories is not consumed. It's wasted. Wow. Everywhere. 33 percent. Yeah. It's about 30 to 35 percent. It's, you know, across some places up to 40 percent. It's true in developing countries, and it's not, it's not just refrigeration or processing. It's, it's all the kind of post-harvest losses. So lack of transportation, lack of infrastructure, lack of refrigeration or cold chains, uh, rodents, mildew, uh, storage facilities on farm that just don't exist or are porous or, or whatever. Um, and so that's on that's on the on the developing country side. On the developed country side, it's also about one in three calories, but it's different. It's it's you know people looking at the refrigerators and throwing food away in a sell by date as opposed to a consume by date. Uh, it's people that um, that buy in 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 grocery stores buy quantities that they can't consume before they start to go bad. And so, you know, there's packaging issues that could address that. If you buy six head of, of lettuce, it's hard to eat six head of lettuce at one go, but if they're packaged individually so the oxygen doesn't start to break the food down, then you can actually, they last much longer. Mm -hmm. So there's less waste. It's just we have to get smarter about these kind of things. But I think the big issue is portion control. The portions are out of control, and we need to figure out how to get them back in line. We've been working with, with a company around their seafood um, offerings uh, and, and basically have suggested that that they cut their portions in half, you know, from six ounces to three ounces. And if people want, they would give them seconds. But that cuts down on the waste. It cuts down on, on their cost as a company. Uh, I think the consumer actually feels better about it. And if, if they don't want it, you can actually give them the second one. But make it a conscious decision, not just an unconscious throwaway line. Uh, because we can't afford to be you know, on a finite planet, we just can't waste resources like that anymore. Here, here's the deal. By 2050, that's 38 years, we've got to produce uh, as much food as we have in the last 8,000 years, in the next 38 years. And we've got to do that, with, hopefully, from our point of view, as an environmental group, without taking any more land. Yeah. Because we don't want the footprint of food simply to grow over the entire planet. If we simply expand food production, then, then we lose biodiversity, we lose natural habitat, we lose ecosystem functions, at least to the extent they are today. You know, as an environmental group, we can turn off the light and go home, which is why I focus on food, because it, food is the biggest threat to the places we care about on the planet today. It's the biggest human impact, producing food and fiber. So that's why waste is so important. By 2050, if we could eliminate waste, then we would have to produce half as much new food. But it, it has other permutations too. Right now, it takes about a liter of water to make a calorie of food, mm -hmm. on average. Yeah. So can we do with half a liter two calories of food? If we throw it away, then we basically add that much more water in terms of the net consumed food. And the same mm -hmm. with greenhouse gases. Let's say you have a ton of carbon for a ton of food. If you waste half of the food, then you've got two tons of carbon for half for what you're effectively eating. So it, it ratchets up all the numbers in the wrong way. Oh, so so saving actually makes it more efficient in lots of ways. Something that uh, you have worked on quite a lot is trying to help the 100 largest corporations in the world mm -hmm. become more sustainable. Right. Uh, how have you done that, and what are the challenges that you've had? So let me, let me just say where this is coming from because um, we, we decided some time ago that as an environmental group we can't work everywhere and we can't work on everything. We've got to become focused. And so we did in-depth science of all the different ecosystems around the world, all those different places where uh, there's biodiversity and where it's unique and there's endemism and we really wanted to kind of do it as a science-based exercise we came up with 250 places, and we said we can't work in 250 places. So then we took it down to about 35 places. And so 35 places became what we wanted to focus on for the next you know, five or 10 years. 
Then we did analysis, okay, this is where we want to work and, and, and why we want to work there. What are the threats? And once we did that analysis, we found that it's 15 commodities. 15 commodities are the biggest threats to the 35 places we care about. Really? And so then you have to ask yourself, well, how do you change those 15 commodities? How do you, we don't buy and sell anything. We're an NGO. Who buys and sells this stuff? What are the leverage points? And so we started to look at it, and we made these long lists of all the different companies, and we found that about three to 500 companies control 70 or 80 percent of the trade of all 15 of those commodities. So we said, okay, that's it. Three to 500 companies per commodity, that's, that's a lot better than 7 billion you know, consumers or 1.5 billion producers. It's, it's a lot smaller number. But as we started talking to those companies and as we signed MOUs with them and got information about what they're actually buying versus how much they're spending, so none of this information is public, then we begin to see, wow, you know, it's maybe only 100 companies that actually buy and sell 25% of all 15 commodities. What As we've signed agreements to work with them and gotten access to data about purchasing, now we think it's about 58 companies that buy and sell 25%. And the reason 25% is so important is because 25% of demand will pull 40 to 50% of production. Hmm. The producers will compete to sell, they'll, uh, they'll produce more than is needed against the same kind of standards if you get standards in place, uh, there's seasonality issues, all kinds of things. So that amount of demand is huge from a marketplace. Now, bear in mind that organics have achieved 0.7 of 1% of global food. 0.7 and we're of 1%. 0.7 of 1%. Boy, well, it sure does get a lot more uh, it airplay. Gets, it gets a lot of airplay, and, and a lot of people care a lot about it, but, but we don't see the results in the marketplace the mm -hmm. same way. And so we're, we're now convinced that by 2020, we have a goal which is attainable, and that is that 25% of each of these 15 commodities will be produced against credible sustainability standards by 2020. That's a huge goal and a huge jump. I bet you have some help in that, though, don't you? You're not doing it all Well, the yourself. companies themselves, they, they are the ones that have to do this. I mean, it's, we don't buy do anything. They, do they want to? Or we, are, they saying, are they saying, look, our shareholders so, say we only have to look at one bottom line. Is that what they're saying? I think the bottom line that, that has their attention is the fact that this is one planet. We're currently living beyond the carrying capacity of it. We're talking about more people and more consumption coming on. Where's all the stuff going to come from? And who's going to compete with us as companies buying it? It's going to be India and China. If you want raw materials, you're going to have to start buying stuff more sustainably. And you know what this means is you start questioning some assumptions like, consumers would make informed choices and those informed choices would actually play out in the marketplace and then play out in the political arena and that everything would get better because of that. Well, we find out that consumers say one thing and do another. And many of them don't even say anything about this. Uh, the average consumer in a grocery store spends 1.8 seconds in the U.S. to make a decision about what they buy in a restaurant, maybe twice that long. Uh, the Europeans maybe use twice as much time, so 3.6 seconds. It's not a lot of time to look yeah. at the science of all the raw materials, all that stuff. Not, not a lot. So what, what we're beginning to say is maybe consumers shouldn't have a choice. Maybe everything ought to be sustainable. So if your goal is that everything on the shelf being sold is sustainable, how do you make that happen? And that's where you've got to bring businesses in because businesses are the ones that can make that happen. This is a B2B thing. Because if you depend upon government, then it's going to be just a gravy goose political football everywhere, won't it? I think what, so, so, but that's good. Government has got to be involved. Because in fact, those 15 commodities, we mm -hmm. care about them because of the impacts. Yeah, what they're causing the deforestation, com they're yeah. using too much water, lots of chemicals, you know, soil erosion, affecting coral reefs, all kinds of things. Now, the private sector, if they want to buy better products that are produced more sustainably, produced better with fewer impacts. We can set up standards. We know how to do that. They're credible. They can actually pull. But the private sector doesn't seek out the worst performing producers. They usually try to go to the better ones, the ones with a better reputation, the one with higher quality food, the ones that are more productive. So they're going to pull the top end of the performance curve. We need to understand how producers at the top become more efficient, more profitable, et cetera, by what they do so that we can translate those lessons for government to push the bottom. Because we got to move the bottom and government's the only one that can do that.
the private sector can't really move the bottom. And yet the 10% or 20% of producers on the bottom cause 40 or 50% of the impacts we care about. Wow. So all the private programs, whether they're organic or fair trade or any of these other things, pull the top, but they don't actually move the bottom. And the bottom is where the impacts are. They're less productive and have bigger impacts. Oh my gosh. And is the bottom the subsistence farmer? Don't it, it, no, it can be a poor, poor performer that's, that's large in scale and connected to a global market too. So the subsistence so it farmer isn't, may be great. It, a it, subsistence it, farmer could be good. It depends a lot on, on his skill set, the technology he has available. And I don't mean tractors and stuff. I, I mean, does he have the technology that's appropriate for the land he has yeah. uh, and what he's growing? You can't grow uh, on, on slopes of more than six degrees. You can't grow annual agricultural crops without soil erosion. And soil yeah. erosion over time is just eroding your base as a farmer. Mm -hmm. So if you have tree crops, if you have pastures, those kinds of things you can do. So it depends a lot. Now, small farmers are small often because they don't have power and they've been pushed into marginal areas. So they're trying to farm against nature anyway. Mm -hmm. So this is just pushing that even faster. You talk about the, the 15 top commodities, or are you talking about things like water and? No, commodities, I mean things like uh, soy and beef and uh, oh. palm oil and, and, and tuna and salmon and, so and shrimp and There's roughly milk 58 companies that uh, uh, impact uh, or, or Have use. Represent 25% of global demand for those wow. commodities. That's a very, very small Well, and, and the biggest is actually the traders because that's the, the smallest bottleneck. Mm -hmm. But traders don't necessarily have any, any reason to change what they're doing, yeah. right? Because they don't make a finished product, they don't face the consumer, they're trying to work with the producers, they don't want to get them angry at them because that's their source of raw materials. Yeah. So it's really the retailers and brands that can pull the traders along. You know, because we have someone <coughs> who is so knowledgeable here, I'm gonna, gonna take a leap slightly outside uh, in the path and talk about agricultural subsidies. Mm -hmm. do, do agricultural subsidies that are very prevalent here in the United States and in Europe have an impact on, uh, on food security around the world? So, yes, uh, but in a funny kind of perverse way. So for example, I would say that agricultural subsidies in the US, more so even in Europe, have killed innovation. Because of lack of competition? If you're gonna get paid whether you produce or you don't produce, what are you gonna it's do? not the same thing. Look at where innovation is really happening now, it's Brazil no subsidies. It's New Zealand, no subsidies. So if, I think, I think subsidies are important from a producer income point of view and a continuity of supply over time because a farmer needs to, to be aware or be, feel comfortable that they're gonna be able to make a living or they're not gonna keep money invested at 3%, you know, return on investment, which yeah. is what a lot of farming is, you know, yeah. five, six, maybe if in their wildest dreams. So that, those kind of issues need to be addressed and the subsidy system may really offer us some insights into what kinds of financial mechanisms are gonna be required with climate change. Because climate change is contributing to a lot of the weather variability we have. We're seeing it right now. Mm -hmm. Four of the biggest exporters of food materials globally had droughts this year. So food production, exports are going to go down, that's gonna have a huge impact on price and political stability. But that's becoming more common now. It's not just a one-off thing. We're seeing that multiple years in a row, too much rain, too little rain, the planting season is delayed by 30 days, 60 days, and nobody knows how long it's gonna last. I think subsidies or government programs that help address that, or insurance programs that help address that insecurity are extremely important as we try to manage finite planet. But subsidies that maintain a way of life are not probably good for what we're talking about. Hmm. I've heard it said that the, the next wars are going to be fought over water. Mm -hmm. Are the ones after that going to be fought over food? Well, let's start with this, this the food thing. So food security is national security. Um, about three years ago, Russia had droughts and they, they um, cut off wheat exports. And within months, food prices, particularly for bread, went up. And the places that were the hardest hit were the places that have very little wheat production of their own. Mm. North Africa, Middle East, what happened? Arab Spring. Yeah. 
just like that, we had a guy in Tunisia who was protesting the price of, of wheat and bread set himself on fire. We had dock workers in Egypt that went on strike because of the price of food. Now, it wasn't the only thing that caused the Arab Spring, but this is just one country closing its borders to trade and how dependent the rest of the world can be on that. This year, four of the biggest exporters, and they represent between 65% of oil seeds and 85% of cereal grains each year, four of those countries are going to be cutting their exports. What's it going to do to political stability? Hmm. Now, we learned how to adapt a little bit in terms of, of this for in the Arab Spring, so it may not, you know, six countries change because of that. So are we talking 12 to 15 because of this? Hmm. I don't know. Maybe it'll be less, but it'll still be something. And, and here's the other issue. 67% of the planet's in an election year. Yes. What, what kind of decisions are politicians going to make about food security in an election year? No, not at all. Well, they're going to make things that get them votes. So in most parts of the world, that's probably keeping food prices low for people who live in cities because cities are with governments. No, I, I'll bet when the audience first heard that there was someone from the World Wildlife Fund here, I, I didn't think they, they probably aren't thinking we were going to be talking about food. Why do you guys care? Uh, it's, it's actually pretty simple. We think that if we don't get where and how we produce food right in the next 40 years, we're going to lose the biodiversity we care about. We're going to lose the ecosystem services we care about. So for us, in order to achieve our conservation mission, we have to make sure that we figure out how to feed the people on this planet and do it in a way that doesn't simply allow, have us expanding to use the entire planet. Dr. Jason Clay, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.